Welcome to the Independent Artist Podcast, sponsored by the National Association of Independent Artists. Also sponsored by Zapplication. I'm Will Armstrong, and I'm a mixed media artist. I'm Douglas Sigworth, glassblower. Join our conversations with professional working artists. Roadshow Warriors, welcome to the podcast. We got a kind of a special show this week. Will, do you want to tell everyone about it? It's like a, it's a Christmas party here, Douglas. Uh, <laughs> I don't have any eggnog, but I've got my coffee. And to be honest, I feel like my coffee this morning is more like uh, penicillin to stave off the herpes of the day. It's it's less than, uh, egg, it's, it's not as celebratory. You got a little disease going through your house, do you? No, no, no disease. Just uh, the day is more like the disease. The day. The, the morning. I see. The sunrise <laughs> is the disease. <laughs> well, why I say it's special today is because we wanted to kind of bookend the year. We started the year off talking to our good friend Benjamin Fry from the Did you just National say Association of Indep- I called him Benjamin, Benjamin. I'm being very formal All here. Right. Benjamin. Ben- Benjamin. You can call me anything. <laughs> All right, ben. But he's going to be with us for the preamble, and we're just going to roll the whole episode. We're going to talk about some current stuff, and then we're going to talk to Ben about himself and about about his career and all about what's new with him. Can so. we talk about why he's just so damn sexy? Can we talk about that? <laughs> we'll leave that for you, Will. Right. We'll leave it all to you. Make me blush. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Ben. <laughs> thank you. Honestly, thank you for having me, guys. I mean, I, I love what you've done with the podcast, and it'll be fun to hang out with you and chat for the next uh, whatever amount of time we've got. It's our holiday party, if you will. Jingle bell, jingle bell. Yeah. (laughs) I should have gotten a drink. It's too early in the day for me to start drinking. (laughs) Wait till you're back in France. That's what I tell myself. (laughs) Well, we said earlier in the year when we talked to you about the survey, we're like, we want to have you back on. And um, it's only taken us 24 episodes to make that happen. So Mm. (laughs) no rush. I'm here. I'm easy to find. (laughs) Well, let's jump into some like current stuff that's going on on the road and everything. So how have your shows been going? What have you been up to these days? Well, I mean, late in the year, I haven't been doing a lot on the road. I haven't done a show since the middle of October, but uh, the shows I did this fall have been pretty great. I mean, I quite honored. I took an award at the last show I did in Stockley Gardens. Fancy. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a different industry maybe this year than it has been in the past i feel like things are different but i'm still actually having good success the shows are pretty strong how so Um, different what do you mean i feel like there's a lot more contemplation on the part of collectors it takes a lot more time i mean in the chat briefly before starting our official conversation here i'd mentioned i just got an email from somebody who had last contacted me in July, and they're mm-hmm. looking for an enormous piece for a February birthday. And they dropped the ball. And in the email, they briefly mentioned, well, the year got complicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like a, I've been getting a lot of big commissions or bigger sales from collectors. But the conversations take a lot longer, a lot more foreplay. Because yeah, for sure. Exactly. There's more details that need to get worked out with the space. And it's more of like, sometimes at the show, we're forming these connections that then play out over the year at some point. Well, it yeah. almost seems like a, um, when I talk to my my gallery owners, the gallery owners have a different, I don't know, they have a different speed in in buying and people stop by once a week and they, they spend some time with the piece and they start to kind of think about it. Uh, it almost sounds like you're describing that. Mm. But the art show used to have that kind of urgency, if you will. And, and are you saying the urgency for, for you sure. is not necessarily there? Yeah. Well, and it's weird. I mean, obviously, some shows have a different customer base than other shows. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, Norfolk, Virginia is not the same as Armonk, New York. I mean, we had a hurricane hit us in, in Armonk, and I had a blockbuster weekend with a bunch of pieces just walking off the turf. Awesome. A That's lot awesome. of delivery Sunday night and stuff like that. So there's still in places at times when people are like really thinking, I'm going to a show, I'm going to buy art. You still get that immediacy take home the the work kind of feel but then a lot of the other shows where it's more the i feel like it's you know the neighborhood crowd or people like yeah let's let's go check out the show this weekend i feel like those people are it are taking a lot longer to think about it i'm not getting for at least me personally i'm not getting as many of the spontaneous conversions you know on site the old yeah wander around and think about it come back and and you know let's talk that line isn't really generating a 
four o'clock on a Sunday, walk back through and take home the piece thing sure. anymore. It's more sure. like six weeks later, I get an email. Remember <laughs> that piece that you had over there? Do yeah. you think that the market is changing a bit that that more of the big scale folks who shop are shopping for themselves and coming to these shows where before it might have been strictly through galleries? In a general sense, uh, I don't know. Like, I don't know how it is at Cherry Creek. I haven't done that show in quite a few years or like the the places where you get. It didn't the, work out the, with the, your schedule. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, right. didn't, I, I didn't want to make the drive this year. Uh, <laughs> let's hope I want to make the drive this year. <laughs> But uh, no, I don't, I don't really know because I haven't actually some of the things like the Texas shows I hadn't applied to a lot in the past and some of the bigger shows. So I don't really have a good data point from the COVID years or post COVID year to talk about that across the country. But in my experience, what I've been saying is the only people with money are people with money. You know, like mm -hmm. that's what I've been right. finding is it's a lot harder to to swing an $800 piece for a family that's looking for an $800 piece. And they, yeah, I'm, you know, people still do that. People still get $800 pieces or $1,500 pieces. That is a much bigger conversation for that family than, than the people who, if you're looking for a $5,000 piece, you know, probably not hurting financially as sure. much. Sure, uh, but you're only offering ham like Ray Alphonse. There you go. <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> Right. I don't. I don't offer a lot of appetizers and bread rolls. I'm. I'm only serving ham these days. So those five hundred dollars. I feel like the middle class goes along with the middle sized paintings and the small. Yeah. Like you've got the the people with less money for Lower the small budget. pieces, the middle and the the, the large. But it's like I, I feel like I'm only selling to the large these days, like the the one percent. So um, if they've got mm -hmm. the money, they're they're but, not necessarily as cautious. Well, you guys work in. I, I believe you, Ben. You do you do reproductions at some shows if they allow them. No. I, I have never done no? reproductions. I do okay. series uh, and actually I like I, I have a whole kind of body of work that is I call it my Rauschenberg inspired series. It's uh, basically I take a stencil of of one of my drawings and I use that in a mixed media context, either, you know, whether you want to use Warhol or Rauschenberg as a, as a reference, but the kind of like layered stenciling with paint and drawing and stuff like that. I use that partly because the idea of reproduction bores me, uh, and partly because mm -hmm. I don't want to deal with framing and sizes and all of that, and partly because I, you know, feel like it may undercut my attempt to capture the people looking for a pure original piece. I do like that theory on it. That's that's what I argue with when I start bagging up my reproductions that I do offer. <laughs> but uh, I do find that that is. You know, for me, that's the the takeaway. I'm working a little bit slower and I'm kind of like certain parts of my work feel like work for reproductions. But I feel like for your body of work, it just doesn't really work out. It's like you are having the same conversation with somebody. Yeah. Well, and the thing for me about reproductions is like I know that there's money to be made. How many artists do we know who, who do it? You know, there's a way to make mm -hmm. that a successful business model. But it's I started my career you know, trying little one day events or leaning my paintings on the sidewalk in New York and stuff like that. And I started with a kind of all original at every price point doing tiny little five by seven original matted pieces of collage and selling them for, you know, 20, 25 bucks. And yeah, they were, mm -hmm. they were abstract. They were uh, process oriented. So I would combine things in interesting ways but each piece became like a, a very spontaneous expression and you can't sell something for 20 bucks if it's going to take you a month but actually that exhausted me so much that when i started doing bigger more image reproducible subject matter that is a ferris wheel oh it's the the oldest ferris wheel still standing in the world it's in vienna austria it's easy in concept to just reproduce it i made this image i'm gonna sell 500 copies with a paint in exactly the same place and color and everything. And it comes out of a printer, except I was so burnt out by doing those like shrink wraps and shrink bags and like miniatures and stuff. The idea just, it exhausts me thinking about doing reproductions in different sizes and stuff like that. 
So I just have never done. Well, I've been thinking about this time with this break that I've had with recovering from my surgery. I'm starting to realize how important kind of a step away from the making of the work plays to our mental enthusiasm towards the work. So it sounds like any aspect that is monotonous, that is not inspiring, can really suck the joy out of the heart of our business, which is the creative. And so if working with truly originals is what motivates your ideas and new pieces, then that's the way you have to go. That's a great point. I, I love the, uh, so Ben and I have been friends for a long time. And and I remember he knew the previous body of work that I used to do. And, and there was a mm. lot of repetition in that. And when I started this body of work, I remember sitting down to dinner and, and uh, making this bold proclamation that I was never going to duplicate Hey, do you remember this conversation? I'm like, I'm never <laughs> going to duplicate a, the same. Uh, exactly. I'm never even going to revisit the same story. I'm never going to do a painting that's the same thing. I'm never going to do that. And so I was making new work and I had all these ideas and I was just firing on all these cylinders. And you were like, I don't know if you remember saying this, but like, you're going to burn out really quick. <laughs> like, more power to you. But and I was like, oh, fuck you, Ben. I'm not, I'm not going to burn. I'm like, I'm making original stuff asshole. every day. And, but yeah, I burned out real quick. Yeah. Well, and the thing for, I mean, every artist discovers this, I think. But the thing is, the amount of time it takes to push the brush, the pencil, the to spin the, the blow, glass blowing yeah. tube, whatever it is, the amount of time it takes to do that is nothing compared to the amount of time it takes to come up with the idea of how you want to compose it, how you want to put it together, and what you want the final color, shape, design, size, right. scale, everything to be. And so if you are constantly every single image creating something that's never been created before, right. you you better be selling in, you know, Gagosian, right? I mean, like, well, you know, when I found that to be, you know, I, I now what I do when I'm, I'm, I'm in super creative mode and I start to get burnt out, then I find myself able to lean back into the familiarity of a past composition that I've done uh, where I'm yeah. like, okay, now let me just kind of clear my brain. I know how to make this piece. I know how to do this. And I'll, I'll, I'm always working in new details and things like that. But it kind of resets my brain and it's the comfort level. It's like, okay. I'm spazzing out. I'm making all of this new work. I'm working on this new body. I'm really happy with this, but I don't know. There's always this kind of inner monologue, this inner dread where I'm wondering, is this going to sell? Is this new piece going to sell? And it's like, well, let me just do the thing that I know, you know, dance with the one that brought me for a minute and mm -hmm. just reset my brain and, and go back into this comfort level where I know I can sell this piece at every show and just make this piece that I know is going to move. Well, I think we underestimate because we make a body of work that might seem like, you know, reproducing a theme or reproducing an idea, but it's not an exact replication. But we, we underestimate the fact that the body of the work as a whole is not seen, is not out there that everybody walks by and says, oh, I've seen that this place or that place. And so, but because we, the artist creates every single one of their own pieces, they start to feel like, like you've done it a hundred times. And so that's really the challenge is to be that unique body of work that you don't see out there yeah. that you're not like replicating what another artist is doing or whatever. Or especially it shows yeah. where you've been there. Um, you know, like I, I take the Chicago show that I just finished up. I've been at that show 20 times. Seriously, I've been doing that show. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, with this body of work, this is my 10th year, I think, with this body of work. I think so, yeah. Yeah. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, well, I need to shake things up a little bit and have an impact piece at the back of the wall that's different. So they're not just like, oh, there's that guy. I've seen him before. You know, they're coming. It's a pretty much the same audience. They bring in new crowds, but it's like same audience walk past. I don't want to be Okay, there's the guy that does that. All right, let's go see this. Let me go look at... Okay, I, I always want to have something a little fresh, especially at those shows that you've hit again and again and again. It's like you need new bait for the fishing hole. Because that one image yeah. could be the thing that makes them stop looking at the new stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. If, if that showcase piece is the same, then they just gloss over the rest. Exactly. So you need to capture it. Yeah. Right. Well, this gets into something we just talked about uh, i think just before we started the the three of us but the idea of getting into a rut i mean i feel like i revisit my own themes and subject matter frequently 
But if you do it too frequently, you get stuck in a rut. Right. Like you're my, for me, you know, artwork is a, it's a communication. It can be a conversation with a collector. You're trying to say something. And when you show up somewhere, you may have done a theme 10 times, 20 times, but the person walking into your booth has never seen that theme. And so for them, it's the first time they encounter this idea or this, this, whatever you're conveying. And in that sense, it can be new to each person who sees it for the first time. But if you go back to the same show 10 yeah. times, then you've got a whole body of people who walk past your booth, who've seen the same dialogue again and again, and you've got to, you've got to shake them up. There's a fine line as an artist between being in a rut and being in a groove. You know, it's like you're exactly. creating your best work and you feel like mm -hmm. you're clicking along or you just fall back into that rut and you're like, I don't know. Uh, here's this again, you know? <laughs> yeah. well, what about the whole idea of that, the COVID bubble that people have talked about? It's like, you know, we came back out of the gate and things were rocking. And we hear both sides currently from people saying, well, that boost we got from COVID is over. Um, or we hear, uh, no, things are still rolling and happening for me. What are your thoughts on any of that? Personally, I, there was a, an enormous bubble, I guess I would call it, uh, right after the lockdowns uh, opened up yeah. and people were able to go to shows. But I think more than anything, it was just that after two years of not being able to see artwork in person, the, there were just extra attendance. There were people shopping who'd been thinking about it, new houses. I mean, our industry follows the housing market. There was an totally. enormous mm -hmm. housing bubble. And so people the are redecorating. redecorating market, all that kind of stuff happened. Over Everything. Yeah. I, yeah. The cranes in downtown, like that's how uh, we've always judged the economy. It's like, okay, well, look, yeah. where are they building the condos? They're building condos. They need to be filled with art. So, but I did feel like that too. Like I, the the year back, it almost seemed like, okay, well, there's last year and this year at the same time, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I'm not sure I would. Yeah. That's why I'm, I'm hesitant to really call it a true bubble because I don't, I think what it was is it just kind of compressed a timeline into four months or five months. And then they got it out of their system. And this year feels, and as I was saying earlier, when you have that reset, it's, it goes back to being a, a new normal almost. Like you, every time we've had, you know, bubbles and then downturns and, and, you know, the shows are great. Uh, oh, the shows are not so good right now whenever it comes back to being good, it's never the same model mm -hmm. that it was before. I think that anything that has continued on for people after that initial injection really is, it's hard to know, you know, we all come back to this market with having more experience, having learned from previous years. And I think that that can't help but make us better at producing better work or being better business people or adapting to technology and learning how to use those kinds of sales models in our work. Yeah. You know, we all get these young artists who come through the booth and like, oh, how do you, you know, how do you do what you do, whatever. And I, I find myself often saying, like, they, they ask the question, you know, God, is it hard to sell out? Are you selling? You have to like make for the market or whatever. And what I end up saying frequently is, Look, you can make whatever you want to make in the studio. Like never, never sacrifice what you want to express in the studio. But in the end, if you're going to do anything other than stick it in the closet, you should consider, you know, who is going to put it on the wall? On what wall? How, how does it, how is it going to fit into that world? Otherwise, you might as well just stick all the artwork in the closet. Yeah. That's a great point too. There's a, there's a book. Actually, I sent it to you, Douglas. I don't know if you've picked it I've up. I've read that. I was thinking that same thing yeah. about David Byrne. David Byrne. Yeah. yeah, he writes about music and he's talking about he's talking about creating for a venue and he's talking about how his his early music that he that they created for CBGB, this little dirty club in <laughs> Manhattan, uh, was so much different than when they were selling out theaters and then stadiums too. It's like they're creating music for you know, you look at the Stones and their early music too, and it's like they're creating for a tiny little rock club, which is now they're creating for stadiums. And and, and, and uh, some of that can also be like unconscious. Like there's definitely um, a point of where we're intentionally, let's say, making a piece with scale for a specific space, like you're talking about with the musicians in the venue. 
but sometimes it's not it's unconscious it's just we we kind of just get in a groove and we that exterior force is uh, affecting what we create yeah and i'm trying all the time to to like separate my work a little bit give it a little bit of breathing room and and show when i show these big pieces that i i'm like kind of trying to give them a little bit of space around it so that they can imagine it in their homes or take it away from the venue you know it's like well this looks great hanging on the street but i mean every single time i've brought a, a painting into somebody's home they're like oh my god i love it in here it's like well you can imagine it in there but mm-hmm. Yeah, your yeah. hardwood floors and your oriental rug look a damn sight better than the asphalt and the uh, the gum yeah. on the ground in my booth, you know? <laughs> That's been my challenge exactly. to not pack everything so full and have every wall full of something yeah. or every pedestal or whatever because people then have a really hard time visualizing it in their space. So it's almost like pulling – a third out of what I would be more comfortable with showing. Yeah, that's a constant struggle for me. I I overpack the booth, and it's helped that the low ends, you know, the the more easily collectible pieces, <laughs> I'll call it, uh, aren't selling because then I am just not tempted to put a, a wall of them out there. Which means, you know, now I'm doing a bunch of double booths, and I often I basically give myself a whole tent for three paintings, and then next to it I'll do a variety of work. I want people to know, look, I. I have a two hundred and fifty dollar original. It you know it'll fit on that little wall that you never thought you could put anything on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like yeah, it's there. But I don't want to fill a wall with that because it's it's distracting. Well, it's distracting, and then you can sell nine two hundred dollar pieces, or you could sell one five thousand dollar piece. You know, it's yeah. kind of a no brainer on, exactly. on where to, sure. to focus. But at the same time, you do want to chip away at the stone of your goal. Uh, you know, it's it's hard. You yeah. know, it's like well, I. I a lot of people don't like sitting around doing nothing too, you know, you sit around and do not, if you've got $5,000 only, then it's like so much, nothing. It's like, you have to have the patience to just sit there and wait for the big thing. And keep your energy up for when that dog, big dog walks in. Right. I mean, cause you can kill it by feeling defeated, like it's not happening and feeling and then the one, when it, someone comes in and it is going to happen, you can just kill that opportunity from just being in the doldrums. Yeah, you can sit there and look real. Yeah. I mean, we've all walked the the show, you know, you head to the restroom or whatever and you walk past somebody's booth that's completely empty and they're just, you know, completely moping and they're like, hey, we should, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to go yeah. in there and talk to that loser. He's, he's yeah. <laughs> exactly. Who's shit in the middle of their <laughs> yeah, booth? All right. <laughs> Checking out their Facebook uh, posts. No, but it, <laughs> right. the small pieces give us energy. I mean, like, not just, not just like chipping off the, you know, the end goal financially for the show, but just like how many times is it, have you had like somebody walk in the booth? I, so, like I was going to say a second ago, some of my best conversations have been with people looking for $200 pieces where they just like, they see this big, enormous wall size piece. They're like, I love it. I can't afford it. But when they start talking about the work, they look, I might have two or three little 11 by 14 originals and they're looking and deciding between them. And the things they say about my work, I'm like, these people yeah. really dig it. They get it. They, and, and I can talk for 30 minutes and Firstly, it makes me feel good because somebody likes what I'm saying. Secondly, in the middle of that conversation, the couple who doesn't really have the courage to jump in and say anything, they're listening to all the things I have to say about these smaller pieces. And they're staring at the $5,000 right. you know, mm-hmm. wall size piece. And then they've already gotten a starter, an introduction into what I'm trying to say with the work. And that makes their conversation easier with me. So in the end, I, I'll keep the small stuff. And that's where, just like, because it, it makes the whole thing dynamic. We've talked about theater before and Douglas's background in theater. And it's like, that's the theater of, you know, you've got your little 10 by 10 or 10 by 20 or whatever you have your booth space is. And that's your the your stage, you know? And, and I, I've talked about using kids that way. And you're you're performing, you know, you're on, you're on the stage yeah. and you're performing yeah. for this person. It's like, well, this is, at least I'm performing forming and bringing people in and you have that energy and you're trying to create that that's that way you can kind of create that feeding frenzy that will rarely but sometimes happen in your booth where multiple people at one time are interested and you're kind of talking you know talking to the little girl who was interested i'm an artist it's like you know get out of here you know, what <laughs> sure you are, honey? And there's so many salty. That old... always bums me out when my neighbor does that to some kid. Like, no I'm way, like, dude. dude, they're just a little kid. <laughs> you know, like, I don't care how much, how big the line is. Just smile and say something yeah. nice to the kid. Well, 
engage Let the kid enjoy it, walk away, and then be nice right. to everybody or, else. And like I do it all the time is just use, <laughs> I'm using kids, but I'm using the kid. I'm talking really <laughs> engage the kid. And all of a sudden the parents are like, well, this guy's not a jerk. Um, he's actually engaging with my daughter and talking about art and talking and, and talking to them like they're an actual human yeah. because they are. And well, and we shouldn't dismiss the fact that the parents won't buy work for their kid that their kid connects to, too. So when they see that, it's not all about sales. Right. I mean, it is forming that connection with the little kid Show is me meaningful the to them. But then sometimes the parents will be like, well, we bought this for their room because they really love this image or something. No, I mean, kids Kids are going to live with the art, too. I, I want them to, to enjoy it. And become it. collectors. And in the end, I mean, yeah, it's you say things in a booth, as you all know, and it becomes a line, but it's sincere. I mean, I, I'll tell people, look, you know, like they'll say, oh, I'm really sorry. I can't collect or I'm not collecting or, or, or whatever. And whether it's, you know, a kid or an adult, I'm like, yeah, well, thankfully, there's a lot of people who do collect my work. So I can have the luxury of just enjoying the fact that you right. like what I do. Mm -hmm. And then 15 minutes later, someone comes and buys the big piece. Great. It all works out. <laughs> Hang tight. We'll be right back. This episode of the Independent Artist Podcast is brought to you by Zap, the digital application service where artists and art festivals connect. Well, I've been getting notices from shows this week that I need to jump on and pay for my booth, but I'm not at home at my desk. So I really enjoy that I'm able just to flip open my phone. <laughs> flip open your phone. Do you have a flip phone, Doug? And, yes. So. And does Zap work on your flip phone? Because you that's impressive. No, but I turn on my phone, I log into Zap, and I'm able to buy my booth right there on the spot. And I can make sure I get that double booth or that corner booth I'm looking for and I don't get stuck somewhere I don't want to be. Quit talking about double booths because if those shits are sold out by the time I come to get to them, I'm going to be mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I sure do appreciate that with Zap, we're able to keep up on our business with the shows on the road using our mobile device. Well, let's jump back to what you were talking about earlier. You said you've been selling your work in different venues for years. You said selling in New York on the streets, leaning your stuff against uh, buildings and stuff. Tell us about <laughs> that whole experience. Yeah. So my, you know, art business bio started actually before New York. I met a mentor in Maine where I grew up uh, and actually a group of artists all kind of connected to this one professional artist who was living in this very small town in Maine. And uh, his name is Rod Slater. And actually a bunch of art festival artists ended up being influenced by him and becoming full time professional artists in, in their career. But basically, you know, I was you know in high school and interested in art. My parents are both very artistic. My uh, grandfather painted and, and so I kind of grew up always liking art, wanting to do art. It's the only thing I ever wanted to do. At 10, I was going to be a cartoonist. Oh, really? be the next Captain yeah. Hobbs. <laughs> That's awesome. But you fell in with kind of like, it almost sounds like a collective, but this guy, your mentor, tell, me, tell us his name again. Uh, Rod Slater, Roderick Slater. Most people called him yeah. Rod. Um, so yeah, I mean, we used to call it the Academy. Basically, a group of kids, 10 years older than my set of friends, actually met him hanging out in a pizza shop. Uh, he would sit there doing the crossword puzzle. And he's a character. I mean, he's come to a couple of shows. He used to do art shows in the 70s. Mm -hmm. There's that generation right. that knows him. And then there's, you know, our generation who, who've who encountered him. He would sometimes come to a show with me. He's a was an amazing person. Um, but basically, he sat there in this pizza shop <laughs> doing crossword puzzles. And interrogating the drivers who, when they had nothing to deliver in this tiny town in Maine, and eventually the question came up, you know, what did you want to do with your life? And uh, one of them confessed, you know, I kind of wanted to be an artist. Or the only thing I ever liked to do was art. And uh, Rod basically said, well, why don't you do that? And as everybody says, well, because nobody makes their living off of art. Right. That's the um, preconceived and, notion of why we, we don't just jump in full force unless somebody kind of gives us that push exactly. or that, that, that sense of you can do this. There is a way for you to do this out here. Yeah, like, I, I've always felt like your story and I've heard your story before, but it's always got this Dickens <laughs> kind of thing. It's like you've got this Rod is like this Fagin character and he's collecting these ragamuffin artists to go sell on the street. And, and uh, it's it's amazing. I mean, if if anybody is ever able to write the story of who Rod 
is. Firstly, it wouldn't be one story because everybody who ever met him has a different version of who Rod is. But it would be an amazing story. I mean, I'm not a writer and I'm, I don't play one on TV. Uh, but he really was unusual. He, he literally, he was one of the most generous people I've ever met. He sat there for hours, basically encouraging these kids to, to make more art and eventually like, you know, to try to bring it to a local art festival in the town in Maine where we all grew up. And then do other shows in New England and talked about, you know, the ultimate shows of, you know, the big prize money shows, Gasparilla, Winter Park, stuff like that, and trying to encourage these artists to try that. And so this group, a generation, you know, 10 years older than my closest friends, a couple of them got together, rented a space because it's a mill town without a mill, and they got a space for practically nothing and got together and basically started living together and making art. And along came my group of friends and we were all, you know, the, the art theater kids in high school with nothing to do. And so it became kind of a hangout. The, they, you know, between the coffee shop and this collective commune we all called the academy, it was the most interesting place to be in this town that had nothing to do for someone of our age. And so hanging out there with an interest in art, my friends and I would sit there and talk all day, all night long to, to the artists, to Rod specifically. And he would constantly encourage us to attempt to, to do a career. So this. was this kind of a formalized thing where he like put out a shingle as a teacher or was it just as people would kind of find him and you just kind of drift into this, this Very kind of informal. learning or this mentoring? <laughs> no, it was literally basically an art collective, an art commune where people were up until four in the morning, you know, smoking and making paintings. Nice. And, and there was always, the door was always open. Rod didn't even live there. He lived down the street, but he was always there hanging out in the kitchen with a half burnt cigarette in his hand and a cup of coffee that had been on the, the burner for 16 hours. Mm. And he would talk until the last person fell asleep. And sometimes he would still be there talking when one of the people who went to bed early got up or some kid came, you know, having some, frustration in their life came in at 10 o'clock in the morning and Rod's still there talking to the person who hadn't gone to bed and Rod would just keep talking. He he was a, a social addict in the sense that he never wanted to stop communicating. He loved people in general. And so that just meant that there was this constant flow of people. And when you sat down and talked to him, you were the most important person in the universe. Wow. He was one of those teachers where it's best to do as I say, not as I do. He had a million ideas of how to make an art career. And yet, like Willie Loman, he never actually got in the car to make the sales yeah. pitch. And right. he didn't care, partly mostly because he just didn't care about the business side of it beyond the idea. He wanted to come up with the idea how to make a great pitch to a gallery, how to make a perfect series to bring to an art festival. And he'd start and then leave the half finished piece in the side and have coffee with somebody for 16 hours and just never get in the car to go to the gallery. That's kind of like the romance um, of the artist, you know what I mean, the the classic not business side person artist. It's like the true artisan or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean I met him one time uh, well, a couple of different yeah. times. You had brought him to different shows, brought him to Alexandria and I mean, just kind of the, the tweed coat and the hole in the pocket <laughs> and the, the hat that has a cigarette burn in it. And I mean, he was an amazing guy, but definitely, I don't know, the idea guy. You start talking to him and he, he would say something to me that I disagreed with. And, you know, he kind of like with a wink in his eye, like, I'm going to I'm going to fuck with this guy and, and see what he says. And just you know, your ideas start to kind of roll. And then all of a sudden you're into this major conversation with him. He was an, he was an amazing guy. Exactly. Well, as you as you said, Douglas. He was on one level the cliche artist. He had he had all these ideas and he never did any of them. On another level, he was this very hardcore, logical, hierarchically oriented mm -hmm. thinker who broke everything down into is it rational and can it be defended in in the hierarchy of knowledge and ideas that I've built up over eighty something years of my life. And so that's the opposite of, you know, Van Gogh with the cliche ear and all of that. So he had this odd 
dichotomy, honestly. But uh, it did turn out that basically, you know, he loved making the paintings and he loved talking about business, but he didn't really focus on making the paintings a business after a certain point in his life. I mean, he was really successful. He, he sold with Faye Gold in Atlanta, you know, one of the top galleries in the South. Um, he sold in really good galleries in DC. He had a really good career. I don't want to portray him as a cartoon, but he basically no, didn't not, care. But I, after a point, he cared more about talking than about business. How do you get the Academy from Maine and Rod's studio there onto the streets in New York? How do you guys get there? So basically, again, it was, you know, I'm following in the footsteps of others. One of the artists from that group, Andrew Weber, who is Susie Scarborough's partner. Uh, we all know Susie from the oh, show. Nice. He, um, so he's from my hometown and he was one of the people who got that group going. He ended up on a trip to New York, whether it was gallery related or what, I don't really know. He ended up meeting artists on the sidewalk on West Broadway, selling their paintings and was very excited about that. And then saw these artists selling at the Met. Some of them, I think I forget the story. He, he could tell it to, to anybody who stops in and asks him, but he ended up, you know, coming back down, I think, and selling at the Met with some of his artwork. And then he went back to Maine. And he brought this story into the group of artists living there. And so some of my friends from my own group ended up moving to New York and starting to test this model of, you know, leaning the paintings against trees, you get a fold out table and you put the paintings on the table and and it worked. And so me personally, my yeah. story is I dropped out of college to move to France because I wanted to learn French. And my best friend from high school is an artist in this group. He called me one time or I called him when I was in France and he said, oh, you got to move to New York. We're selling our paintings. It's amazing. We've got this apartment. And I had had plans to stay in France for the rest of my life. <laughs> I never <laughs> wanted to come back. Um, wh whether I had lo logical plans of how I could do that is another question. But I thought, well, I could use a little bit of money. I'll go to New York for a couple of months, make some money and go back to France. My goal was to apply to the art school in Paris. And I had I knew a professor there who I had taken some cultural uh, anthropology classes with, and he'd encouraged me to apply but it's a December, January application. So I had all this time and I thought, well, I'll go to New York for six months from July to December, and then I'll go back to Paris. And as commonly happens, you start a new direction in life. And I just dropped the idea of applying to school in Paris and whatever. And I just kept on in New York. I love that image of you guys uh, setting up your paintings on the sidewalk. It, it starts to sound like Carol Swayze and Duke Lawson and, and how right. the beginning of the art show industry was. I mean, there, there really aren't that many. I mean, there's Armonk there. I mean, there are art festivals in New York, but it's more of a gallery scene yeah. and it's more of a, like a sidewalk scene. Too. Well, I, think, I mean, is, I think of exists. Europe, I think of my travels through Italy, uh, Venice, and there'd be the artists sitting right there in the squares, attracting tourists and, you know, doing their little paintings. I mean, that kind of has a little bit of a European feel to it was that in paris did was any of that there so yeah i mean the the thing is there is actually there's a big art market of independent artists that happens i think it's monthly and maybe every two weeks in paris in front of the montparnasse tower and there's a couple of those street markets i mean a lot of a lot of towns even the tiny little town where camille and i spend a lot of time near where her family's from in the south of france they have these artisans or creatives markets that happen in, during the summer once a month or whatever. So that kind of venue of like, oh, I made something, I'm going to bring it down, you know, on on three days a week, there's cucumbers and, and tomatoes. And once a month, there's somebody who makes something out of wood or somebody who does sketches or whatever showing up. But that particular model has always stayed very accessible in Europe, but very small scale. So they don't have what we have, these big art festivals. But actually, the New York art sidewalk arts market really did start with an inspiration from Europe, the Washington Square Art Festival, if you look back, and they have a thing on their website. But they they describe how in the very early days, a few painters came back, you know, with inspiration from Europe, started leaning their paintings on the stoops in Washington Square, and then Basically, I think it might have been 
I think his name is Alfred Barr from the, who, you know, started the Museum of Modern Art. He saw these artists. He had a gallery. I forget exactly who it was. Um, not, <laughs> not an art historian, but, um, a couple of people from the gallery world got together and decided to formalize this selling on the sidewalk. And it's a super interesting history. In fact, there's, there's a woman who wrote a book about the history of art festivals and how that was inspired by those European markets. And for my generation in New York and, you know, the, the people who came before me, basically what happened is the artists kind of intermingled with the people selling, you know, buttons and tchotchkes and, and, you know, cutouts of calendars inside frames as though they were photographs and stuff like that. And original artists just would bring their stuff down to the sidewalk and, you know, mingle with the whole crowd of people selling fake Rolexes and everything and sell paintings. And that's what I did. That's what my, my friends did basically show up and find collectors. And New York is such a big city with so many people walking the sidewalk that you have people walking past you into the store to buy $600 Oro Tootsie Po and boots and whatever, and they don't even notice you exist. And then one of them comes out and says, yeah, I'll buy this $800 painting. Sure. <laughs> you know, like it, it's, it's a really odd environment for coming from the art festival world. It's a completely different experience than what we do in this industry on a, on a weekend. But it's, it is the old, the old model. It's kind of how it started. Right. Very, like Douglas said, very European kind of model. And so you guys are, you're there and Rod has already planted the seeds with you as far as uh, prize money shows and some of these Florida shows. You're on that 95 corridor (laughs) where you can zip down to Florida pretty easily uh, through DC and Virginia and all of this stuff. But you had started out as a strictly collage artist under Rod's mentorship. And I wanted to kind of talk to you about changing your stream, you know, changing your pace. I I know I remember very clearly when you posted that first elephant drawing on social (laughs) media and and that thing blew up. I mean, talk about the light bulb that went on when, when that drawing came out. So as I mentioned briefly, you know, at 10 years old, I was certain I was going to be a cartoonist. I, I love, always loved drawing right. as, as an action. So kind of like, and like Will and you have that in common, a little bit of the illustration start. It's yeah, true. Definitely. Yeah. I, I love graphic arts. I love illustration. And like, I remember watching my father paint and me sketching. And one day he gave me some, some paints and a canvas and I basically drew with the paints and it's like that that's always been my thing even when in high school I did some arts magnet programs in the school not talking about the my influences from Rod but I've always been interested in imagery and the drawing aspect of imagery even my my acrylic paintings from that time were very drawing oriented so when I started making art Professionally, I was in the mood, as you said, I was inspired by Rod and collage and the capacity of collage to convey really complex narratives, almost a visual poetry. But as we said before, you can kind of get in a rut. And what happened was I started losing my inspiration for the narrative, for the for the story itself of the layered collage. And I started wanting to do something else. I started wanting to make an image again, like an image, not yeah. using an image here and an image there. I wanted to just make make a picture, you know, like <laughs> this is this is an illustration of this concept or this this thing. I was inspired by something I saw Lenny Bruno, who's Chris Bruno's mother, working with in her own work, which was using a lithographer's pencil in a really creative way. It's similar to the Jasper Johns kind of drawn lines that look almost like charcoal. And basically on a whim, while I had a studio full of abstract collages, I literally took a lithographer's pencil and stuck a piece of paper on a wall. And I drew what ended up being this elephant that I posted to Facebook uh, that you're talking about, Will. Yeah. And it had a quality that was ambiguous. It was both joyful and maybe a little bit reminiscent of of carnival or circus or something like that but also a little bit quiet subdued maybe even sad and people responded really positively to it in my close friends group who saw it in person and then on social media and it's like as you said a light bulb went off like this is something i love to do i love to make and it wasn't long i basically went 
radically turned left and went in 90 degrees mm -hmm. from what I was doing. And instead of doing abstract paper collage, I went into graphic illustrative drawing as a primary medium nice uh, and switched within not even not even six months i was i was literally showing up at art festivals with my new body of work that's really cool I, it's funny you and i have been close for a long time and i remember showing you a piece that i had done separately i was like hey come on out to the truck because you had your collages at boston mills and i had metal quilt and i was like come on out to yep. the truck i want to show you this piece that i've been working on and i showed you this this piece and it was like you're like, oh my God, that's, wow, that's really cool. That's uh, really similar to what I've been doing. <laughs> or, you know, and it's so funny, like you and I have so many different people. Like, I remember feeling bad at the beginning. I'm thinking like, God, I, I feel like I'm, you know, I don't want him to think I'm copying him, you know, and that's, so we just have kind of traveled the same path to the point where like, it starts out at the beginning. We talked about this on the podcast too, where we are not alone and we are not our competitors. I love that thing. Uh, what was the yeah. quote? I don't know if you can pull it right out of your head, Douglas, but you posted um, a great it, quote. It's a long one, but the gist of it is we're not like athletes where we're competing against each other. That art is not a sport. It's not a competitive nature. There's room right. for everybody and in and it. And that goes in line with so many of the, th the different threads that people have talked about, whether it's Signe and Ginna or Chris Dahlquist. We all kind of rise as one. And I, I think about that you know, how many different times I have hung a piece in a home that one of Benjamin's pieces have, has been hanging there too. I'm like, hey, it's my boy, you know? And exactly. It's, it's not brothers-in-law. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, if you like, a lot of times, if you like me, you like him and it's, it, but it's not a competition. It's like our work does have a similar thread to it too. I can't tell yeah. you how many different people have come into my booth and been like, oh, do you do the Ferris wheels? I'm like, no, but here's his contact. <laughs> Exactly. No. And that's the thing. I mean, I've said it before to you, but you know, I'll say it again. I, I feel like even though we had a similar graphic quality, right? When yeah. we started our new bodies of work at a similar time, I, to me personally, that's, that's just showing that we share a, a passion for similar aesthetics and yeah. similar materials. Basically. I wanted to be Thomas Nast or Frank Miller. You know, that's who, <laughs> those were my heroes. And I'm still trying to figure out who I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing is, like, how many times have I been to a show and and I hear like, oh, you're also doing that. And it turns out they're talking about collage material behind imagery right. or graphic lines on paper or simply the fact that two drawings are heavily black and white with some sort of color behind them. And it might be you. It might be Aaron Heckenberg. It may be Banksy. How many times have I been told that my artwork looks like Banksy? I'm not spray painting anything. Not I'm not all. doing, you know, girls with balloons. I love Banksy, but my work actually doesn't really look like it. Like it's, there's a high black and white contrast and a graphic quality. And those two elements are really similar, but I have more material and technique inspiration from someone like Jasper Johns, even though my aesthetics are very different. Than I have from As some of the public, they really are able to identify similar, let's say, technique or style or like for in my case, they'll think all glass blowers work looks alike because it's glass. But you know what I mean? It's like if you are a yeah. collector of glass and somebody who knows what they're looking at. No, but you'd look at the 20 or 15 exhibitors in the show and it's completely different bodies of work. Same thing with what you're talking about. Absolutely. And that's what people can and, kind of hang their hat on and that's fine. You can't take it as an artist. You can't take it as an insult because that ends the conversation. If you're, oh, you're offended or you hate what they said, they're really, again, you know, uh, you're the hot person in the bar that they're trying to, to be like, hey, you come around here often? You're like, oh, what a stale, stupid line. And we're like, you just said that the person was, uh, you want what I'm selling, you know, really? They're just like, that's hey. That's their <laughs> intro. That's your foot in the door. Exactly. And it, exactly. you might think it's dumb, but that's their foot in the door, so you can't really judge it. Yeah. Well, and to speak to what you were saying before about this industry where we all, you know, we're a community, we're friends, we're acquaintances, we're, we're you know, all setting up trying to sell to a similar body of collectors we are aware of the fact that some of us are really working hard to communicate a certain idea, aesthetic, body of work in that way. And, you know, I get, like I said, you, you said it about the, you know, the Ferris wheel or the elephant or whatever, but like, I get that sometimes people will talk about, oh, you know, this kind of 1950s rockabilly music <laughs> aesthetic. And I'm like, 
let me let me give you his card. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> exactly. I, you know, like I, I'm not personally. It's not my vocabulary. I'll tell them honestly. I, you know, it's a cool subject, but it's not the thing I'm trying to express with my work. And Will expresses it so well. You give him a call, and I'm sure he'd do something. For Same us. thing with me. With like, um, somebody came into my booth and they started talking this this talk about a, a custom piece, and they were like, "Have you ever done anything with more like splashes of color with, with like mid century modern and all the stuff?" And I had. You know, I, I, I've got the work and I'm like, man, you're not, you know who could do this and you'll be really happy with I'm like the Grosjefinkos around the corner. <laughs> I'm like, they got <laughs> mid-century modern and, and like somehow current modern meets this, like go talk to them. And that collector actually bought from me at the following Cherry Creek. And we had a relationship because he was so happy with the painting that he bought from the Grosjefinkos. All ships rise as one. Yeah. Right. So um, <laughs> you had that major, that kind of that shift when you introduced new materials and it kind of yeah. lit a fire under you and a direction under you. When I look at your work, I feel there's like a romance to it. There's motion. How do you describe how you feel about your work or what are the words that you put to your work that kind of describes your style or what you like to make? I like to say that my work is unified uh, in the themes of motion and perspective and energy, as you said. Interestingly, when I started the body of work, you know, the first image I kind of made in this direction was that elephant piece. And so I started thinking, what other work fits in that. And I did a whole body of work. I did some gallery shows with this kind of circus and carnival theme. And then I brought it obviously to art festivals. A lot of people kind of associate me with the circus and carnival imagery. And every weekend, if I have a Ferris wheel or something like that, I've stopped doing so many of the kind of animal pieces for many reasons. But one is that the circus is a complicated subject, but also because it wasn't really the, the core focus uh, of why I was doing it. But someone will see, for instance, a Ferris wheel and they'll say, oh, did you, you know, did you grow up in the circus? Do you work in the circus? <laughs> and I find myself, I use this line a lot, but it's like, well, no, but I put up a tent every weekend. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and you do a lot of is, those promoter shows, which you, I've heard you refer to one of the major promoters down south as PT Barnum of arts festivals. I'm not trying to burn <laughs> any bridges, but I love that line, and especially the fact <laughs> that you're selling funny. that imagery as well. Well, so it's funny because actually what, what really drew me in the end to all of that imagery, carnival, circus, animals, and everything, wasn't ever the circus. It was that energy, the movement. There's this, you know, that first elephant piece I had done, you know, an elephant encountering a child. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, you know, that, that makes people think of the circus. The moment is actually from an African sanctuary. You know, the original source image came out of a, a sanctuary image where a child is meeting an elephant and it's a baby elephant. So it's these kind of two young minds meeting. And to me, that moment of meeting is interesting. There's that, that emotion with that. And then with all the other kind of circus and carnival imagery, it's motion focused. I did a whole body of work with flying machines with like old zeppelins and seven layer biplanes or you know, septaplanes or whatever that never actually flew because it's that movement, that energetic spatial representation that I like. It's like a sense of enthusiasm that, that I mean, I know carnivals do in circus do give off a feeling, a feeling of right. happiness and youthfulness and, and wonder. And I, that all gets captured from that. Absolutely. And I play on that. I like that. I mean, I don't, it's not like I dislike the fact that people associate my work with the circus or the carnival. For most people, that's a really amazing experience. I mean, at the advent of the circus, regardless of what, you know, ethics are involved with circuses as a concept, at the advent of the circus, when the circus came to town in, you know, the middle of nowhere America, it was the first time most people in those towns had ever encountered anything beyond Main Street of their town. Mm. So it was a it was a way for the world to open up in in a way that generations later television changed people's perceptions of the of the outside world it was really a, an encounter with things that they never could have dreamt of this is the stuff of mythology except it's in front of them a man fighting a lion that goes back to hercules mm -hmm. and yet here you are there's a guy with a bull whip and a lion in front of him i mean it's it's so people have these really strong associations and i like that that it's this positive sense of wonder the potential for for humanity to surpass itself 
to do things that we didn't think were possible. Yeah, I love that. I love that feeling too of, you know, we we come out of our of our houses and we meet with communities and it's like all of these feelings are are generated from an image you're creating. It's that that feeling of connection, that feeling of being uplifted, of being exposed to new people who you've never seen before, but then also like enjoying it with your family or enjoying it with new people around you. It's it encapsulates such a huge sense of an experience beyond just the image itself. And I love that yeah. about thinking about Rod uh, again going back to Rod and him kind of saying what's the perfect series to show at an arts festival and and the venue. I have seen your career as you've edged toward what you are creating. And it's like, okay, well, here are the elephants. And you're like, okay, well, I might have to cut the elephants. And okay, I'm trying to go for a feel of optimism and romance and childhood innocence, as well as this feeling of nostalgia that Mm kind of comes in. And it's interesting to see you kind of edge towards finding your groove, you know, and then you can kind of sit in that groove and, and create. And I'm always, it's true. I mean, that's a, that's actually a pretty clear description of, of what I'm aiming at. And the, the trick is in these artistic journeys, you never know what it's going to look like when you get there. I mean, like my newest kind of experiments have been these flowers that I've been working with, uh, because they're, you know, they're very expressive as a subject matter. And I tinker, I try something and then I go back to the studio and six months later, I try something new. And, you know, I saw collectors will contact me. Oh, I really love this one I saw on Instagram. And my already my flower series has diverged from what I was doing six months ago, a year ago, whatever. And occasionally I'll bring one to an art festival to see, you know, get the response of people on the street. But it is that sense of like optimism, a uh, sense of maybe maybe a little bit of a sense of wonder or childhood, as you say. And as you were talking, I actually thought of something one of the unifying themes of my work from the perspective of collectors is family, which is really mm-hmm. odd way to, to think about it. But what I get from collectors again and again and again is whether it is the architecture, the fire escapes of the, you know, Williamsburg, Brooklyn windows, or whether it's the circus or the carnival or a Paris scene with a Ferris wheel or something like that a huge percentage of my collectors have a personal family connection to that image. That is, Mm -hmm. I I just did a commission for a woman in Norfolk whose father took her to an amusement park with a roller coaster and a Ferris wheel that is now gone. It no longer exists. But her memory of doing this with her father is so important. She ended up, after a couple of years, she ended up contacting me and saying, yes, I really want a custom piece to commemorate this experience with my father. I've done pieces for roller coaster enthusiasts who've been on every roller coaster in America and who have favorites. She wanted a roller coaster, not because she loves roller coasters, but because it reminds her of her father. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the the urban pieces, the fire escapes and the the windows and everything. People come and they say, oh my God, you know, my dad grew up on a house on a street that looked just like this. I do. Mm -hmm. Now I'm doing custom pieces where someone like tells me the address of their childhood home. And if they're lucky, they've got a picture. And if not, I have to go on Google Images and try to find the structure of the building and what the windows look like to recreate that street where their parents grew up in the Bronx or in Brooklyn or whatever. And so it's odd, but it's it's like all of these things, in a certain sense, come back to that connection of childhood, family. Sometimes our audiences tell us what our work is about before we even know Mm. what it is. Yeah. You know, I feel like there's a dishonesty if you sit there in your studio and like, what a family's like. Mm, you know, yeah. I'm not seeing you grasp it like, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the day out at the ballpark or the, this or that. It's just like, okay. You can't come um, at it from honest. that intention of like, I'm going to make what people want. You make what connects and then other people meet you there. And yeah. I feel like this year we've had several conversations with the idea and the theme of nostalgia, how artists will focus on what is meaningful to them in history or memories and other people join them in that search and they they resonate with that yeah well and i this ties directly into piece of writing that i worked on more than a decade ago that i ended up presenting to a small group of of people but i called it the viewer is a creative force and Mm -hmm. to me it i i'm not sure i ever expressed it perfectly but to me the artist doesn't get the right to dictate meaning. We as artists, we have a story we tell ourselves. We have something that we want to express. 
And if we're lucky, what we've created is a vessel for meaning. And we show that to the world. And then the viewer, the, the person who comes in and experiences it, they create meaning themselves. We don't get to say, oh, no, that's not how you can interpret it. Mm -hmm. The best we can do as artists is make a vessel that can hold meaning. And then each person who comes up to the object, the image we create, they're going to bring their own story, their own background to it. And they're going to fill it with their own meaning. And that's as true as whatever story we tell. I mean, how many musicians don't want to tell the backstory behind what their song is about because they want people to connect on their own personal experience with exactly them. and one of the last one of the worst interviews i've ever heard is the, the interpretation of stairway to heaven by the group <laughs> led zeppelin it's like i i, did, I didn't want to hear that <laughs> i know well that's the same thing when you hear the the real story behind like you can't always get what you want by the stones it's like well keith really wanted a cherry soda and the drugstore was out of it <laughs> They're like, well, we thought it was blood and cherry red and the devil. And we're like, no, he really wanted a cherry coke. Just a cherry <laughs> coke. That's <laughs> it. And he was, he was, he's out of luck. <laughs> but that's interesting. I love that. Like music is a big theme in, in my work. And, and I love that um, Douglas and I, I mentioned it earlier on in the show, but David Byrne wrote this book, How Music Works. And it ties right in line with, so there's your, your reading material for the independent artist podcast. I'm, I'm enjoying it for that's the a winter great book. months. <laughs> Yeah, and you can pick up little passages, and um, it's it's almost like an interactive book for me. I've I've written in the margins and things that uh, cool. that translate to my own work, but I, I love that kind of thing and how music and art definitely has its own similarities and and hand in hand. Even going to a town, setting up, performing your art, breaking back down, moving on down the road. It's all of these songs that that artists write from Jackson Brown's turn. The, no, wait, what is it? stay a little longer and turn the page Seeger. in the drive-by truck. Heck yeah, man. Uh, <laughs> all of those songs about the road. I, how many, the opening act by the drive-by truckers, how many it. times when you, when I've had a bad show, have I driven away being like, it ain't my time. It ain't my town. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's just, it's sometimes you're the opening act for somebody else's great show. Well, Ben, earlier you mentioned being in Paris before you came back to New York and kind of started that, but you have a longer history with Paris than just that that little snapshot, right? <laughs> well, my, my history caught back up to me. Yeah. So actually, <laughs> okay. By the time this airs, everybody's going to know, but Camille and I went and eloped at City Hall on Monday. Hey, congratulations. congratulations. <laughs> That's fantastic. Congratulations. <laughs> We've been contacting our family and, and friends and stuff, but we haven't we haven't put it out there. But anyway, it'll be it'll be out there. So I don't even know how to introduce the subject. That, but, that um, really gets rid of like I was going to call her your lover, and I was like, that's <laughs> I don't want to do that. That's just it makes know. it really simple, doesn't it? Yeah, he's like, taking a lover yeah. in Paris. Just goes right in line with my Charles Dickens naughty storytelling. But uh, that's just the image I've created for you. But. Your wife, Camille. Sorry, let's let's move on. Exactly. So, yeah. So, although Camille and I just got married this month, we met six years ago, and she's French. And, I mean, very soon we knew that we were interested in being together for the, for the long term. And so, over the last six years, she and I have gone back and forth to, to France. She's doing her PhD, uh, as a lot of you know here uh, at UPenn. And so, you know, we, we spend our time on both sides of the Atlantic. But yeah, Paris has always been kind of a, a point of inspiration for me, France in general. Interestingly, I always wanted to learn French since I was a child. In an odd way, it's specifically because of my mother. For some really? reason, she always wanted to learn French. And when I was a kid, we had some audio cassettes learning French. I failed to sign up for French class in high school. And then when I went to college, the school I went to did two years of ancient Greek and two years of French. Okay. But all my friends a couple years ahead of me told me, look, you can translate Rabelais after this, but you, you won't even be able to order a coffee in Paris. It's totally useless as a <laughs> spoken language education. And after my second year of college, I dropped out and moved to France because I really desperately wanted to learn French. And I'm glad I did. And those uh, seeds were planted from your mom. They literally come from my mother, who always wanted to learn French, who's now, she's on 850 days of Duolingo, because of course, <laughs> when we told her that, <laughs> when we told her that we were eventually going to probably get married and, 
she really wanted to come to France and meet Camille's parents, which she did this summer. She's got, you know, an extra fire under her ass, so to speak, <laughs> to, yeah. to learn French. So she's doing great. In fact, she just did a, a class, a distance learning class in French in Maine, where she, where she lives. And she's super motivated to be conversational and fluent in French. And now it's me who's inspiring her. Whereas, so know. what would Freud say about the fact <laughs> that we asked you about your your experience in France and Camille, and then you immediately just started talking about your mother? <laughs> <laughs> As any good academic will tell you, Freud not necessarily the only way to interpret things. <laughs> <laughs> so you went off to Paris without knowing the language at all? You just dropped yourself into France and were like, I'll just assimilate. I'll figure it out. Yeah. So basically, I mean, there's no other way to put it. I got a hair across my ass and I really wanted to go there and learn French. And I, all of my attempts to study French in, you know, high school and college seemed to be frustrated by, by circumstances and an opportunity fell in my lap. I had, I had considered teaching English, but because I didn't have a bachelor's degree, I couldn't sign up for teaching at an institute. And so I'd have to do private lessons and I considered various other ways of doing it. And a family in Annapolis who were French uh, had an association with my college. And I mentioned casually to them that I wanted to be an au pair. Okay. And they happened to know somebody in France looking for an au pair. And six months later, I was on a plane going to France with my little you know, pocket-sized French dictionary learning <laughs> to count to 10 and asking, you know, <laughs> Où est la toilette? Uh, <laughs> you know, like, really important questions. So you had that experience being in Paris and then coming back to the U.S. and you were kind of on the ground floor of being on the show market. And your your mentor kind of pushed you down the road of doing these road shows. So what happened was, and so my mentor Rod was a huge influence in my life on many levels. But interestingly for both the decision to sell on the sidewalk in New York and the decision to eventually bring my artwork out to art festivals. That actually came from friends of my own generation or, or a little bit ahead of me who were kind of breaking ground. In New York, basically, it didn't work for me to sell my paintings on the sidewalk. I had friends who, had, who made their entire career that way. Personally, I was scrambling to pay for an, a very inexpensive room mm. in New York City. Like I had an insane deal and I still barely was able to make ends meet. And so I ended up getting other jobs. I apprenticed for an amazing bookbinder in New York who influenced me both artistically and, you know, life-wise. And I ended up working security at a Broadway theater, you know, the kind of random stuff. I worked as a, as a server in a restaurant and eventually those types of secondary jobs just burnt me out. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go back into making artwork. And I knew that selling on the sidewalk in New York wasn't going to cut it. And so I started testing, you know, the small New England art festivals, New Jersey, a little bit further, trying Virginia. And I had more and more success. And reinvesting yourself into how do I make a living at this doing the artwork, which is the thing I love, realizing right. that the other market wasn't working for you? What other kinds of choices do you have? Exactly. So basically, you know, working my restaurant job, I made good money working just a few days a week. I was able to do some artwork. I saved up a nest egg mm. and I just quit and kind of went cold turkey <laughs> on work. And that gave me some time to make paintings. Except what when I went into the studio, I started making collages because that was my influence from Rod. And as I as I started looking at you know how to bring these into the market, the art festivals were just so much more successful than leaning my collages on the sidewalk in New York that I started looking at how to make that more full time. You know, you buy the van. This is the story all of us have done. You get the van, you get the professional tent, you buy a set of walls that sucks, you buy a set of walls that doesn't suck. And <laughs> we all have you know, a set of walls that suck. <laughs> exactly. And like, you know, I remember I did my first two day show ever in my whole life. And I made like $2,000. And I was like, Oh, my God, it's gonna be amazing. How much money am I gonna make when I go to Coconut Grove? That windfall. And yeah. then I didn't make yeah, I didn't make the scale of increase. And so then you start the long slog of like, okay, how do I turn this into a business where I'm doing 
just shows to get by, shows to make this work. And basically that was in the early 2000s. And by, you know, the mid, mid 2000s, I'd kind of gotten on a roll with that body of work where, where it, it, you know, made sense. I had a system. I kind of knew what shows to do and all of that. As you're finding your career, you know, and the market and how to kind of navigate and make a living, what motivated you then to kind of give back and to be on the board for the National Association of Independent Artists and then kind of take on a leadership role in that way? I'm going to be really blunt here. So when I first, <laughs> when I first, that's, first you, I that's what we first, want. My first big national art festival was Coconut Grove, basically 20 years ago. It might have been 19. I don't know. And there was the the morning meeting of Naya in the parking lot by the building that's now been blown up and turned into a garage. There was, you know, a little meeting with artists talking about Naya. And I went and I was like, oh, give me a break. <laughs> what what okay. are we doing here? I don't even know what the, what the organization does. And it's boring me. And I left. And, you know, over the years, I would read the, the independent artist. I, my favorite thing was the newspaper. Other than that, I had no idea what Naya did. Well, before we did the podcast, for those people who don't know the history, there was a newsletter that Naya would put out kind of talking about current issues and advocacies and all that kind of stuff. And that's what you're talking about. You'd read that paper about what's going on out there. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of the artists we all see at shows still, I mean, they wrote really interesting articles about current issues, topics, problems. And so it's entertaining and there's a little bit of social stuff. But other than that, I had no interest in the association. I'm not much of a board member person. I mean, like like most of us, I probably couldn't hold down a real job if someone <laughs> tried to pay me to do it. So yeah. I ignored it. But at one point, uh, I got to be more involved in some of the things that were being organized. This application was doing conferences and they were doing sessions on different topics. And at one point, I was asked to be a panelist on one of the conferences because of my role as an administrator of the group Greg Turco started Art Fair Review on Facebook. They'd asked me to come to the panel on the Zap conference and talk about the next generation of artists and how to get young collectors and young artists more invested and successful at art festivals. And I did the panel and 30 seconds after the panel was done, a bunch of people Terry from the NAIA came to me and said, we want you to be on the board. <laughs> and there were some <laughs> former board members who were, who were leaving at the time who were also there at the conference. And they basically cornered me in the hallway outside uh, this session and said, it's exactly you know your energy and everything that we need. I think they had lots of plans and dreams for me. I'm not sure whether I actually <laughs> succeeded in them. But I literally, I had this kind of moment where I thought, you know what? I can criticize the NAIA or say, oh, they don't do anything as I'd done for a decade or more. Or I could say, sure, I'll join the board and I'll see what I can do and see if, if my skills are useful and if I have the patience for board meetings, which is exactly what I did. Once I got into the group, I, you know, I enjoyed the dynamic and everybody on the board of that generation and also of our current board of directors is really passionate about making things work for art festivals. And that basically is is what keeps me on the board of directors, is that I, I want to be involved in a group who is trying to help when an issue arises or when there's a new topic, such as online exhibitions and things like that. I'd like for there to be an organization that represents artists to be able to express something and, and take a stand. So the organization was founded to kind of advocate for this market. And it's evolved a lot over the years. We've we've seen it at a starting point and midway point. And then, you know, it's kind of got visions and goals for where it's going. Can you talk a little bit about that whole trajectory of what NAIA is? Sure. I mean, I know a lot of people or several people who were involved at the beginning of the original meetings when the NAIA group got together in Chicago and then in Ann Arbor. And there were a few other events uh, over one summer in the 90s where artists started talking about a union or some sort of group that would regulate shows. The original idea, probably every person present had a different vision of what they wanted. But the original idea was some sort of artists union 
And over time in forming the group, I know that the idea of a, of a union or some sort of like rule setting organization ev- evolved because that's not exactly how our industry works. We as artists are actually consumers. We pay for a service, a booth fee. We're not employees of art festivals. Mm-hmm. And so unions typically work when Ford Motor Company is the single paycheck for thousands of auto workers. And mm-hmm. those thousands of auto workers can say, we're not going to show up at the factory if you don't do this for us. That's not at all how our industry works. We're an industry of scabs, if anything. <laughs> like, oh, you're not <laughs> yeah. applying to Cherry Creek? Great. <laughs> more more chance for me. We're the original gig workers, basically. Yep. And so it's not – that model doesn't work. And despite the fact that some artists wish it did, the NAIA evolved away from that and became a kind of guidance industry uh, organization attempting to maybe set standards before they became an issue. Many of us remember the slides. There was this chaos where you would pay hundreds or depending on how many applications, thousands of dollars a year to have slides printed. And every single festival at one point had a different rule of how to write the name on the slide and what was up and all of that. And the group- The the, orientation of how they get loaded for the jury to see. And the classic NAIA decision was to standardize that marking system, including a red dot on the slide. And that became kind of the symbol of something the NAIA was good at. Most art festivals in the country adopted that standard for paper slides. And then when digital applications started, the NAIA was really heavily involved in making sure that there was one single digital image standard. I love hearing the history of how it got started. When I think NAIA works the best, it is as an advocacy group, as a voice for artists and some of our concerns and and helps to to voice the collective thinking if you can even do that. What are some of the ways that that Naya is working right now? If you can kind of talk to that, I I feel like the group of volunteer board members works best at taking ideas and problems and opinions from the entire art festival industry and kind of consolidating them into a recommendation or bit of counsel or a suggestion. Some of the things we work on is helping promote the industry as a whole. Actually, there's a there's a, an initiative by a couple of the board members to come up with some video that can be used by shows that don't have a budget to make a video to promote the concept of art festivals to their community, as well as to promote the specific festival just before it happens so that there'll be something maybe on social media for all the small shows who never do any kind of PR release. Like an integration of something that's kind of standardized and national, but then also they can put their own personalized flavor for their event in their merge together to use. Yeah, we're looking to create something that's a, in a toolkit for shows that lack the resources to generate this kind of material for themselves. Is this to generate interest in the show? for the community or to get sponsorship? What's the what's the goal of the video? The goal of the video, and you know, I'm not taking the lead on this particular project, but I'm involved in the conversations. The goal of the video is essentially to create interest among citizens, you know, local, local residents, to right. make the show have a little bit more energy among that base. To, to get people, more people out on the street, to get people more involved in the festival. Create a, a kind of a whole new vibe too. Volunteers, Volunteers, Volunteers exactly. sponsorship. Exactly. Just raising the public's awareness what these festivals are about. And, oh, maybe this is a desirable place to go, to buy artwork, to live with artwork, to to experience a show, that sort of thing. Yes, yeah. and I think we I don't think Naya could have a better person kind of heading up that than Evan Reinheimer. He's the one that's putting that video together Absolutely. And his terrific series that's on YouTube about art shows that if you enjoy this podcast, definitely suggest checking out his YouTube channel as well. Yeah, his, his YouTube channel is great. One of the changes that I'm kind of excited about, too, with the organization is for years we've tried to operate as that kind of that artist union, that that idea of being a membership group where somebody will pay a fee to get benefits bestowed upon them, to advocate for them. And we're moving, we're reincorporating into what's the type of nonprofit that so we're incorporating into? Briefly, the NAIA was created as a 501c6, which is a which is an industry membership group 
that can make political advocacies to change laws and things like that, and can have other aspects of member benefits. What we're transitioning to is something basically that embodies what we've done all along, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that attempts to create a public good. That is, we are attempting to make art festivals in general more successful for artists, more accessible to the public. Serve as resources for shows to give them data and feedback on what makes a good festival and event for artists, which then improves the market all around. So really, we're there to help the industry as a whole. Right, because the difference essentially is if we were behaving as a true membership organization, when somebody has a problem, we would check the membership roster and tell people to go stuff it if they hadn't paid dues for the last year or two. Whereas Mm. what actually happens, what's happened for decades, is when an industry problem arises, something like an issue with applications at a show or spaces at a show, the NAIA gets together, the board of directors sits down and talks about, is this something that's big enough or seems awkward enough that some sort of collective voice should come together and express an opinion. And then we go out and we talk to the show. We talk to board members of the show. We talk to people, artists who've experienced problems. And we say, okay, well, it looks like this whole thing is happening. And in general, this is not good for the artists. It's not good for the show as a reputation that the show has, which is completely not taking into account whether or not any of the people involved are members of our organization. So we've never really operated as a membership organization. Mm -hmm. We've operated as as an organization that advocates for artists to try to make shows better for all of us. If listeners out there find that they want to help promote this advocacy the, in the market, that they can they can donate to NAIA to to help fund the initiatives that are needed. How can they do that? We have a really simple donate link on the website. And in the end, we are a very lean organization. We have very few expenses, but things like the software of the website and stuff like that and and various aspects of, of running any nonprofit take a little bit of money. And so the donations are always useful. And as we try bigger projects like the video project, that takes a little more resources. So any donations are gratefully accepted. This is a completely volunteer organization. It's just artists like you and I who are trying to help out and and to raise the the level of art shows and and people are just trying to help. It's not like, you know, the the union name gets bandied about and artists have a tendency to disagree, especially this time of year when we don't have shows. <laughs> I find that <laughs> yeah, th- this time of year gets particularly testy online uh, among artists and people start getting feisty, but it is just a group that's trying to get out there and help, uh, help each other, help art festivals as well. If something's not working and maybe, you know, not everybody always likes advice, but at the same time, uh, a lot of shows will reach out to Naya and ask. And it's a, it's a great advocacy group for, for all of us. And it's true. Show directors will, will often reach out. They'll email or call knowing that one of us is on the board and say, look, we've got this debate in our own board of directors about what to do for next year's show mm-hmm. regarding a new layout, regarding what to do with the port johns whatever it is. And working on like the next generation of artists. I mean, that's been a big thing right there. Another big advocacy we're working on is shows have reached out on how can they implement or how can they work with other shows to learn about emerging artist programs and what is actually effective and what is just like giving a a newbie a space and having them show up and figure it out for themselves so that there's actually more of a mentoring process going on. So that's also something we've been working on in, in, in AIA. Yeah. And my my personal vision, I mean, I was I was the only person who voted against myself as chair of the board when, when I was voted onto the chair. Uh, my personal leadership philosophy is full democracy. I want consensus. I want the group to work together as a whole. And honestly, there's been so many years of the NAA asking for membership fees, asking for money from artists. Personally, what I want to do as a group is I want to create something that is of such benefit to the entire community that people are excited to just say, oh yeah, I'm going to give them five bucks. There's, you know, such a helpful organization there, or I'm just excited by the fact that there's a group of people out there 
giving their time to try to make the industry better. I, I don't like the idea of an organization that's constantly begging for money. I want to show people what we do of value. And then people will will help us do it by donations, by giving their time. You know, that's at the core of, of what Naya is, Ben. And we do appreciate the work that, that the organization does, which is why we kind of adopted them as a sponsorship, really, as far as the podcast goes. Sure. We are the newsletter. You know, we're the newsletter. For exactly. The new direction that Naya is going, trying to take it kind of into the future. But And even more than just like policies, just through these talks, we find out what's important to us as professional artists. And we talk to people who work in different mediums. So we get this broad perspective on what is important in the industry. So I think these conversations are really good to get things moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like the best thing we can do is community building. We attempt mm -hmm. to bridge the, the distance between shows and artists and among artists and among shows. And the podcast is a perfect example. It's not a function of the NAIA. It's your project, you two. But what mm -hmm. we can do is help, you know, lend it a little bit of voice, whatever publicity we can give it. And then you turn it into something amazing. Well, we're all holding hands together. It's kumbaya. It's the time of the season, right? <laughs> it's a good way to end this season, right? The end of the <laughs> right. year. We're going to take a little time off and enjoy family time and recreating and and kind of come back to 2023 with a fresh perspective on hitting the road again and and making a living out yeah, there. Yeah, getting right back on that that uh, wheel, chasing that cheese, <laughs> gentlemen. Let's do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, Ben, congratulations on your wedding, on your marriage, and we're really happy and happy holidays. Thank yeah, you. congratulations, Ben. It's been wonderful talking to you, and it's a great way to kind of wrap up the year. And yeah, happy, happy times. And are you spending, uh, you going to spend the holidays in, in Paris or, or Virginia? We're spending them here, and Camille's family is going to come over around the holidays uh, to, to spend time with us. So we're we're hanging out here in Virginia. <laughs> this is a year where were we're they not pissed that you eloped? <laughs> <laughs> well, eloping is 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 a good description of it. Although our families actually knew in advance. <laughs> nice, good good plan. Yeah. Well, cool. thank you guys. I'll see you uh, next time, and thank you again for this this talk. It's been really enlightening and fun and cool. Yeah, and honestly, fun. thank you guys for having me. All right. <laughs> it was fun. See you guys later. This podcast is brought to you by the National Association of Independent Artists. The website is. NAIAartists.org. Also sponsored by Zapplication. That's Zapplication.org. And while you're at it, check out Will's website at willarmstrongart.com and my website at sigwithglass.com. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to be notified when we release new episodes. 